Hey guys, welcome to the Asian Hustle Network podcast. My name is Brian. And my name is Maggie. And we interview Asian entrepreneurs around the world to amplify their voices and empower Asians to pursue their dreams and goals. We believe that each person has a message and a unique story from their entrepreneurial journey that they can share with all of us. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Asian Hustle Network podcast. Today, we have a very special guest, and his name is Eddie Kim. Growing up as a student athlete in Southern California, Eddie received a Division I swim scholarship to the United States Military Academy. He ultimately received his BA in political science from the University of Southern California, while also completing USC's Army ROTC program. Upon graduation, Eddie was commissioned as a second lieutenant in the California Army National Guard, serving as a human resources officer. He finished serving in the rank of captain in the U.S. Army Reserve as a career management officer. Eddie founded Big Game Management Inc. in 2018. Since starting his own agency, Eddie has worked with various recording artists, ranging from local rappers to Korean pop and hip hop stars, models, radio stations, Olympic sports athletes and various film projects and owning his own apparel line. His commitment to excellence has put him in position to represent, guide and mentor artists, entertainers and athletes as they follow their dreams. Eddie, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'm just so excited to be here. Um, Just love the work that you guys do. Uh, Just giving a voice to Asian Americans. And I know there's a lot of uh, young Asian American parents or Asian American bachelors and bachelorettes like myself that are 30 plus. And we got the young, I know uh, there's a lot of young Asian Americans that are young entrepreneurs that are 21 and 20 to one, 21 to 25 age categories. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We're super excited to have you here today. And, you know, just reading that intro got me hyped, dude. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I know. Yeah. Let's, uh, let's, hear, let's hear more about Eddie Kim, the hustler. How did it all start, man? So man, it's a, uh, it's a roller coaster ride. So born and raised in uh, LA uh, and Orange County. So, I have a very, very typical mom and dad fall in love story. So Mm -hmm. my father was a former Korean, South Korean, uh, president's bodyguard. 79 to 81. That that's during cold war times. That's Russia during USSR times, like communist Russia, North Korea, trying to unify South Korea and their communist regime. So my dad was on it all the time. So, um, after the army, my, Grandmother was the first female gynecologist doctor in South Korea when Korea split. So she she was the money maker of the household. Um, my grandfather served with General MacArthur during the Korean War to fight. Um, and so being an army officer in the family, a U.S. Army officer specifically was a big deal. And let alone getting into U.S. Military Academy, of course, was a huge blessing. And uh, my grandmother, especially my um, my father's mother, was very, very extremely proud. Mm-hmm. So my father, after his army commitment for South Korea, he he ended up being a foreign exchange student at UC Riverside in 1980, in the early 1980s. He said then that was real cow town. Like Riverside now is nice and, you know, it's getting, you know, city-like. But back then he said it was real cow town and... Um, he's the first one that let me know what, uh, racism was like back in the early eighties for a foreign exchange student. Mm -hmm. Um, and my mom, my mother was a Korean airline stewardess when Korean airlines first started opening. (laughs) (laughs) And yes, they met on the airplane from LAX to Seoul. Uh, I heard from both my parents that my mom flaked on my dad the first date and my dad still waited for three hours. And you know, back then that was like pay phone or house phone times. Uh And on the second date, my mom's flight got delayed and he still waited two hours, but I guess the second date. Really? Really interesting. I know, he must've really wanted to your mom. (laughs) You know what? Uh, My dad told me like on, uh, I heard this story when I was like 11. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that's when he felt like I was hitting puberty and I should know about girls and whatnot. So (laughs) he told me like when he met my mom, he already had like 
uh, an engagement possibly with another lady. Wow. And uh, it didn't work out. So he was kind of like on the free market, but he's like, you know, this is uh, what traditional Korean family. So they're trying, you know, my, my grandmother and grandfather are saying like, hurry up, let's go. Mm-hmm. And by that time, my grandfather already has passed away from diabetes and high blood pressure. So uh, he knew time clock was ticking. Uh, he was, and but he said he met my mom or he saw my mom at the on the airplane on Korean Airlines, mm-hmm. and he's like, I gotta get that lady. I gotta get that woman. And like he was hell bent on making it happen. And I heard he went through some hoops and troubles. <laughs> so. My dad has your hustle from? I think so. I I think uh, that (laughs) that will to win, that will to win Mm -hmm. definitely comes from my father. Like that, he, that's why he is a very successful businessman in Koreatown. Um, Mm -hmm. But it's even to this day. But yeah, he was, uh, so my dad has three older brothers. Mm -hmm. um, And my third uncle, his wife used to be a Korean airline stewardess too, but she got out of the game after she got married and had my cousins. So somehow he got a hold of my aunt, asked my, described my, described my mother to my aunt somehow. And my, my aunt was like, maybe this girl or that girl <laughs> ended up giving a number to my dad, but that number was the my mom's best friend's number. <laughs> and then he was like, no, 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 my, uh, the lady I'm looking for is uh, uh, Sun Hee. And he's like, oh, okay, I got you. And then that's how the first date my mom flaked on happened. So, he uh, stalked her on Facebook. <laughs> it's like, it's old know, school, that, old school hunting. Yeah, he, yeah. And when he said he wanted it, oh, I'm, I'm pretty sure I know what, you know, what kind of uh, motivation he had. <laughs> um, and for my dad, it was like, so my grandfather did, my grandfather and grandmother on my dad's side was very, uh, I would say very prominent in Seoul, Korea, uh, especially when the, you know, the country separated. And my father, all my uncle and my uncles were dentists and doctors and stuff like that. But my dad was the youngest and kind of like the troublemaker, you know, um, mm-hmm. he, ran, he ran around with a tough crowd and just because my grandfather was a congressman and my grandmother was a doctor. He got away with a lot of things during that time. And, but he was the one that said, hey, I'm not going to go um, through, through the route that all my brothers have gone through or my, my, what my parents want. I want to go to America. Mm-hmm. I want to do better for my children. I want to see what life is out there, what life is about. Um, so he ended up graduating Chapman, uh, transferred and that's where I supposedly got conceived was in Orange County at Chapman University, that area. <laughs> um, and my mother, uh, so, and my mother is from uh, south, the southern tip of South Korea, with, which is in Busan. Mm-hmm. And my dad was born in Seoul. Um, so born and raised in Koreatown up until my little sister was born, uh, which was three. And that's when my parents bought a house in uh, the San Fernando Valley area, in Northridge. Mm-hmm. Sunny Hill was very high school? Yeah, uh, that's in Fullerton. Uh-huh. Uh, I grew up in the 818 area in the valley, which is 25, 30 minutes north of LA. Uh, endured the 1994 earthquake, which was crazy now. That was crazy. I was seven years old, or six or seven. I vividly remember the house shaking. I remember um, the National Guard then was helping out. Korean markets were passing out the yukejang, the little cup, cup ramen and stuff like that out to people. Um, and grew up, uh, went to a private Christian school, good little kid, uh, had to give a big shout out to that private Christian school. It's a faith Baptist school and church. Uh, they made you memorize like whole paragraphs of Bible verses at five years old and you have to recite mm-hmm. it in front of class. Wow. And all, most 32 kids all used to like knock down the memorization. So yeah. I would say the academic level that I had at that school definitely prepared me for my further education opportunities and, um, and my religious, uh, yeah, I was very religious during that time. I, when I was seven years old, before my athlete, athlete times, I thought I was going to be evangelist. I was telling my mom's cousins or mom's friends, like if they were at my house, I would bring out the Bible, I'll be reading Bible, I was doing whatever the school was 
kind of, I want to say brainwashed, but yeah. drilling into our heads, I was doing the exact same thing. And I am a loyal type of person. I'm, I'm loyal to a fault to a point. So I know that, um, <laughs> but, uh, started swimming. Swimming came to me naturally. Uh, I heard when I was a little kid, you know, when babies hit the shower, some cry, some love it, some don't care. Yeah. I was a I was the baby that was crying when I was leaving the shower. I'm like, no, 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 let me be in the water a little bit longer. Like, what are you doing? Like, I was that type of kid. And, um, you know, it's California. There's pools, beaches, yeah. pool parties. Every little kid has a pool party for a birthday at least once or twice, okay. right, in their lifetime. So I didn't know how to swim, but I was still always trying to jump in. And I would do some daredevil stuff, too. And my... <laughs> my mom and dad knew okay you keep an eye out uh if you keep an eye off eye off on him at a pool for like a minute he's jumping off of the nine feet and he don't even know how to swim and that i actually did that too so that's when my parents were like okay we got to teach him how to swim like he loves the water too much he's going to risk his life anyway so let's teach him how to swim and uh the private christian school the school's owners uh it was a pastor owned school Mm -hmm. And then the wife was like the school administrator. And then they had, uh, they're a Viking family and they had like eight sons and one daughter. So they had a big family and the bottom two sons were like swim instructors for the summer swim program there. And I got to learn how to swim from them. Uh, how you started your athlete days for swimming and then you got into like, want to like hear more so, about athlete days and then get into like the sports management side. Oh, so the athlete days came around at seven. Uh, after the swim lessons, uh, it was time for me to level up from the swim lessons time. I'm seven years old, but all the neighboring club AAU type level teams were not accepting me. They were like, he's a, he's a, he's a slow, skinny, small Asian kid, you know, and I'm seven years old and they're trying to put me with the five, six year olds, like five year olds and kindergarten kids. I'm like, I'm in second grade. Like that's disrespect, I, I, you know, major disrespect. Right. And I knew, I, I understood that I'm getting, you know, they see my mom and dad, the typical, you know, I could only imagine what, especially then in the early nineties, what white, parents, you know, white people would have thought about us then. Um, and I just went through that. And luckily I got uh, passed on to another team that, was a very small team at Cal State uh, Northridge. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's where my journey started. Uh, I was the slowest kid on the team, of course. But I had love for the game. And I put, I didn't have the talent or the size, but I had the love of the game and the high work ethic. So I climbed my ladder up, up and up and up. And I got to a point where I was making Junior Olympics. But I was a one trick pony. I was only good at one, one stroke, brush stroke. Mm -hmm. oh. It's my favorite. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, too. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Perfect. Uh, so that led to more opportunities and my dad kind of got a whiff of, whiff of that. And that's why I have major respect for the ball family, LeVar, Tina, the whole ball brothers. I know what they went through. Um, I lived kind of a similar life to that, but it's just, my father was kind of, LeVar Ball on steroids, you know, like <laughs> I had a tiger dad, you know, I know there's a lot of tiger moms and the dad's kind of on the layoff side. My mom was more on the layoff side and my dad was on me 24 seven, especially at, when I started becoming a big athlete. Um, I would say I started off slow. Once I started getting traction, our team started falling apart. Our little club team got started falling apart and all the big top kids started Started picking their, uh, you know, picking their routes. I was the last one. Um, basically, it was almost like a pecking order. Like the top four went off, and then I was like next in line. And my dad was going to follow uh, another Korean American older male that was kind of, you know, leading the way. Uh, he wanted to go follow him. And usually, all my sports decisions, uh, my dad made him, but on that one, on the most crucial time, I would say in my career, my mom made that decision. She was like, screw it. I know you don't want to drive to Koreatown, but yeah. you got to go to Coach King at Morning Star Swim Club. Mm -hmm. um, that's the 1984, 1988 South Korean Olympic coach. Like, wow. you got to go there. I know it's a drive from the Valley to downtown or Koreatown, uh, five, four o'clock, five o'clock, but you got to do it. 
and it was probably the best decision. Um, that's where Brian and Maggie, that's where I went from one trick pony to just making it to Junior Olympics to winning now five gold medals at Junior Olympics, seven gold wow. medals. At, like, you sure you're not athletic? You sound pretty athletic, athletic to me. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, had a had major success. Uh, I was the number two na- number two ranked uh, swimmer in my age group in the year 2000 uh, in junior high, and that's where I had the dreams of possibly getting a scholarship. Um, and I think my whole career, as even being a swim coach right now, currently as a high school head coach and coaching at the D3 and junior college level. I think my swim career led me into doing coaching and leading into becoming an agent also. Uh, had a strong early career, but this is what I heard all the time when I was like 12, 13 and I was winning all these gold medals. Mm-hmm. I had some haters. Of course you're gonna get haters. And when we used to walk around swim meets, uh, especially at finals where there's, you know, a two thirds of the meet is cut off for the evening. When my dad and I would walk in, it was obvious. It was very obvious who we were, you know, because everyone else was tall, big, tall, and white. Yeah. So, um, and the haters were most of the Caucasian people that, mm-hmm. you know, their kids were getting second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth. And they would be like, oh, you guys start early. Yeah. You guys start off early. Yeah. Well, mm-hmm. you guys plateau or burn out before mm. college so i've heard that since i was 10 and it's always been ingrained in my brain that's why i did extra practices uh i used to train in the summertime i would train five six hours with my national level club team but mm. my father and i would put another extra two or three hours during that day so i'll be training eight nine hours a day in the summertime um yeah. and uh high school started off well Freshman year, I started off well. I was in CIF. I was, I was varsity. I was on the. I was. I could have been on our high school varsity at Sunny Hills, um, as a seventh grader. Uh, mm-hmm. But when my swim career started moving up, my parents decided to move from the valley to Orange County because the swim game still is. Orange County is the hub of Southern California. Like that's where all the Olympians, all the Division One recruits are at. So, my parents always knew, even though we were with Coach King in Koreatown. The big fish is out there in Orange County. So we did make that move. And I ended up going from a private Christian school where it was very diverse to Parks Junior High and Sun Hills High School in Fullerton where there's, man, we had Korean chemistry teachers, you know, like we had Korean class as a real Korean IB. You take Korean SAT2, we checked out a 720 out of 800, mm-hmm. even though my grade was crap because my teacher and I didn't get along. She thought I was, she, uh, she didn't like me too much, but uh, <laughs> uh, she was a hater too. Um, I really have uh, to appreciate like your dad's dedication to growing this ability. Yeah. You, know, uh, like, you moved to Orange County knowing that that's going to offer the best opportunity for you. Is already pretty, pretty unorthodox for an Asian family. Oh, mm-hmm. definitely. Um, yeah. Especially I, in sports. Yeah. And like, your your life story like i love every single part of it because i feel like i really resonate with it and just like before i get into that like i love that story with how your parents met (laughs) your mother must be beautiful because every time i go to korean airlines all the stewardess are super beautiful (laughs) but Uh, just like uh, yeah go ahead she's uh she's over 60 but Sometimes I get the, oh, is that your older sister or is that your <laughs> girlfriend? I'll be like, oh my goodness. Like, that's that's so amazing. amazing. You yeah. guys know that St- Remember that Stacy's mom song? Yeah. Stacy's mom. Oh, yeah. Oh, you just put that, replace Stacy with Eddie's mom. And that was the one. <laughs> as soon as my mom came to practice that day, my oh. mom rarely came to practice, especially when I got older. Thank <laughs> the Lord. But when she came, oh. Um, oh my goodness, the whole locker room. That's, that's the one day at, in the locker room I'm trying to get out of there ASAP because all I hear is Eddie's mom has got it going on. Oh, they're chanting in the shower. Um, little kids too, like the kids younger than me, like my sister's friends to like the older homies to like my peer group. I'm like, oh my goodness. 
That's so funny. <laughs> but yeah, when I was growing up, I was I was also going to church, and I felt like I was being brainwashed to you know believing in Not religion. I, I, I respect all religions. Yes, yeah. I'm, I'm still Christian, you know, and I think it like a lot of you know my identity. And I was also doing swimming. Like my mother, my father put me in swimming classes, and I'm actually like shorter than five feet. So they would put me in like the baby classes or if I like upgraded to the more advanced levels, they would notice that I would be slower than the other people because they're a lot taller than I am. So yes. they're, they're like, OK, you get a head start or like or you be the last person, because if I get a head start, they will eventually catch up and I'll be kind of like blocking everyone else from going ahead. So they're like, OK, Maggie, just just stay in the back. <laughs> You know, but I didn't let that affect me because I loved swimming, you know, and I, I love your mindset. I love that you actually took that experience and you like put in more hours, those more hours, you know, they went a long way and you saw that everyone else had that advantage physically, but you didn't let that get in the way. Yeah. For I want to hear about how this transfer over to big game management, mm -hmm. TTN, oh, on so. X. Uh, where this all started, I would say is. Um, when I did get hurt during my swim career. So high school started off well, but it, it, it didn't end well. Or the middle part was really tough because I did suffer an injury that affected me. And that's when I knew when swimming was almost taken away from me, that's when I knew, like, you got to have a backup plan. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and then my own recruiting, my own college recruiting affected that this has to change. Something has to change because – this is what I was told um, by a Division One recruiting coach. He said that my kind don't belong in Division One. Yeah. We belong in a Division Three academic school, where yeah. our parents might even have the money to fund an Ivy League money. Mm. Wow, that's brutal. Yeah. And because I am under six foot, I am five. I say five eleven because the <laughs> army got me at five eleven, like five ten three quarters. I just round that up, oh. but um. It was because I was that, you know, and that I have my trajectory of the career was I survived up to get to a college scholarship, but it was it's not what it was when I was in junior high. Mm -hmm. So yeah. um, my swim career ended early and then uh, that transitioned into coaching. I just felt like as a as an athlete, I just didn't finish my career the way I wanted it to. Um, mm -hmm. My last meet was at Army Navy at the Naval Academy and I this that's when I knew what mental health was all about um I had a culture shock at West Point um born and raised in LA like the sun comes up at 5 30 and the sun goes down at eight o'clock you know New York City that's you know you wake up or I would go to morning practice two classes 9 a.m and it still looks like it's 5 a.m you know in the winter time you know negative seven wind chill not my type of day you know and the night and the day ends early too so i did have some struggles um and i was 17. Mm -hmm. i had a roommate that was 23 he went to iraq twice he had hair on his chest i had no hair you know like I, i'm a little boy you know <laughs> it was a major culture shock um but i learned a lot of lessons there um i ended up taking a break from the swim team that ended up becoming a retirement basically. Mm -hmm. And I know the lot I know a lot of college uh, freshmen know the freshman fifteen. Well, I got the freshman forty. Uh, I lost my identity. I, I didn't I didn't know who I was. Um, I was morning practice, afternoon practice, swim meets every weekend for the last eleven years, every day. And I didn't even have an off season because my dad said that's where on to the next comes from, Brian, where yeah. I won five gold medals over the weekend at Junior Olympics and Junior Olympics ended on Sunday. Monday morning, I'm at practice preparing for it. That was summer Junior Olympics preparing for spring Junior Olympics. <laughs> and my dad said, well, you won five gold medals. Well, you got to defend that now. It's time to sharpen up your sword for the next fight. And I was there at 530 in the morning, the next morning again. No breaks, no days off. Um, and that idea uh, kept with me. Um, but going back to that time at West Point, I, I lost who I was. I gained 40 pounds and I was eating. And that's when I realized 
I'm a major fat ass because I started <laughs> eating my feelings. Okay. I'm eating like extra large pizzas, like with all the toppings all at once mm -hmm. because I'm missing home. I'm not swimming anymore. I'm just, I'm just a cadet and it just didn't feel right. I, mm -hmm. I was the, I was the n number one recruited position player at West Point going into the recruiting class. You know, I had other scholarship offers from rank schools and I'm not doing it anymore. I'm no longer, I look at myself. Okay, this is when I knew I was in trouble. Second semester at West Point. My uniform is based off of my athlete days, 153 pounds, 9% mm -hmm. body fat, eight pack. I look like Goku, but a skinnier version, you know? <laughs> and, and I gained 40 pounds and my button unbuttons during class because I gained so much weight. I was like, oh my gosh. Like I was like, <laughs> I was like doing this the whole time, trying to <laughs> keep the buttons in together so the captain or the major that was teaching our class or a lieutenant colonel didn't see that I got, I became a little fat ass, you know, like a little Buddha looking kid. And I was just like, man, that this, that's when I knew I was in, um, I was, uh, I was struggling a little bit. And um, my swim coaches all ended up getting let go. Uh, the swim team, I have, I, I'm, I'm going to be proud to say the swim team was a, the biggest troublemakers, the guys swim team at West Point when I was getting recruited, biggest troublemakers on campus. That's mm -hmm. more than the football players, but I could tell you that much. They had some shenanigans going on. But <laughs> uh, due to that, uh, I had, I thought I felt like it was the best start over. You know, the recruiting coach that recruited me ended up moving on and stuff like that. So I started over and decided what to do. I was kind of lost, uh, but kind of had a footing of what I wanted to do. But this time around, I didn't want and this is what I've heard a lot over the years. When I take it my scholarship or when I did win a gold medal, everyone would be like, oh, it's because of your dad. It's because your dad pushed you. That's because your dad. Nobody gave me, I always felt like I got discredited from my own blood, sweat, and tears. Like there's other kids that are super talented, but they aren't, they're tra trying to cheat the practice. They're trying to, they're being lazy at practice. I'm there working my butt off for, for the coaching staff and for our workouts. Like, People always discredit that. They're, oh, no, it's because your dad is watching you. Mm -hmm. No, maybe I like to work hard. Like, if we're going to come to practice for two hours, I'm going to put my all. <laughs> like, we're paying for this, you know? Like, I want to get better, so I'm going to work hard. I know, the, I know the formula. Like, let's put in work. And But when I came back, and my dad was very strict. Um, signing on to West Point was the reason why. my mom, And that was my mom, too. My mom was pressuring me, too. She was like, Realistically, if this was Edward Kim at 17 years old and my mom and dad were not a part of it, I would have gone to a UC and most likely UC San Diego, probably live there, meet a hop a Korean girl and make a couple babies and never come back to LA and <laughs> beach bum and we leave the beach condo for the rest of our lives. That was kind of what not too bad. Like. Not too bad life, you know, right? <laughs> uh, work in San Diego, maybe coach there and you know, whatnot. Uh, I knew my mom and dad always knew that I wanted to do something crazy like that. So uh, when I, my recruiting signing day was not like ESPN like, but we had the Korea times and the Korean newspaper. And I think radio career was there and they had all my little offers. And I was a little, uh, I had like my own mindset growing up, like as a high school kid, even though I was like a very loyal and obedient son, to my mother and father, I kind of had that like, ooh, I'm getting, I'm an adult now. I'm gonna do whatever I want. I'm gonna flip the script on these, on my mom and pops. So in front of them with all the cameras I actually picked out, like I actually had my hand out for another, you know, another school. Like, oh, I'm gonna go for the UC right here. And I'll never forget, like, my dad kind of held my hand. He's like, just came up to talk to me and said, Dad's been super strict and had that leash on you super tight throughout your whole life. I never went to no school dance. I never went to prom. I was always training during those school dances. I was always competing during those proms and whatnot. Even if we didn't have a competition, I was still training um, for what's down three weeks from now. Uh, never went to no friends' birthday parties. I have morning practice the next morning. There's no more. There's no sleepovers. None of that. It was all about the game. Um, trying to get a scholarship and he helped he told me if you sign 
And if you go to the school that dad wants you to go to and mom wants you to go to, and you see my mom like, mm-hmm. <laughs> like I'm like, mm-hmm. dad will let go of the leash. You could be in, you could be an adult. You could be the man you want to be. And I was like, all right, let's go. Give me that West Point signature right here. I'll sign that right now. <laughs> right there. And when I did come back, that was the same speech he told me. He's like, remember what dad told you? You came out of West Point. You lost your scholarship. You lost all that free education you earned. You on yourself. You on your own. Dude. Dad got other things to do. Dad, mm-hmm. dad now washed my hands with you. I have my I I have my dreams to go pursue now, and I was on my own, and I respected that. Like he let me be, and and that's when I knew Brian. That that's when I knew I was like, I'm gonna change. I'm gonna I'm gonna be who I want to be, and that's where. That's when I knew, one day the end goal is to be a pro sports agent. I just didn't know how and when it was gonna be, and at that time, there was a show called. Uh, entourage on HBO that was super popular in pop culture. <laughs> I'm gonna be honest with you. I was going to USC at the time. I was living and I was coaching swimming at the time. I was coaching at a junior college and I was um, coaching club swimming. No matter what we were doing on Sunday nights, uh, eight thirty, we all send a group text. Remember when that was a slide up phone? You know, you were you yeah. got to press seven, eight, nine, a couple times to get a T, you know? So um, <laughs> we would all mess, a group text message saying 911 to the pad and then entourage, period. That's it. So whether you're on a date, whether you're on a family dinner, whatever, 8.30 rolls, everyone, all the roommates, we all jam to the house. We all head down to LA. Whether you're from Orange County or from Downey, we all head down to LA to watch we get there around like 9, 9.30-ish to catch True Blood and get ready, you know, get all the snacks and popcorn all ready, you know, and the beer and whatnot ready, and we watch Entourage. And for me, I would watch Entourage, and the next morning I would have to go to Army PT at USC. So, uh, yeah, Entourage is uh, – that's when I knew. I was like, I know I could do that life. But I got some duties to do, like Army. Um, I knew you had to have an education. Uh preferably a law degree or something equivalent to it. Um, and a movie that, a movie that I want to say movies and TV kind of helped me build this idea. Mm-hmm. Jerry Maguire, my mom and dad love Cuba Gooding and Tom Cruise, like them too. And so I'm six, seven years old going to the theaters, watching Jerry Maguire. I know it's a, a I know it's a sports movie, but I'm like, as a six, seven year old, I kind of understood what Tom Cruise was supposed to do. <laughs> I, I totally understood 100% watching that movie. I'm like, huh, I know what he's exactly what he's doing. And I think I did get little interviewed at Radio Korea when I was 10 years old. And they asked me what I wanted to do. And I did tell them, even though I'm, a, even though I want to be an Olympian, which I did have a shot at with the South Korean Olympic team. Uh, but I said, even though I'm a superstar athlete, if even if I become a superstar athlete, I want to represent myself and all my homeboys when I when we go sit down on the business table. Mm-hmm. And that's I think that does come from my dad's side, um, and the sports agent. The whole the whole sports thing. My dad's best friends, a lot of uncles, you know, dad's best friends, dad's close friends, childhood friends, high school friends, they're all volleyball players and basketball players for the Korean national team. So there were always six, four, six, five dudes at my house playing little toys and <laughs> playing my nerf ball and stuff like that. And when I got a little older and they would come, I would, I would th- we had a little uh, house court. I would throw alley-oops on them. And these guys are 40, 45 at the time. I'm, I'm just throwing alley-oops. No, you guys don't care. No, I, let me throw you another one. I got a better one. And I'm thinking I'm Nick Van Exel throwing alley-oops to Vladdy Divac or whatever, you know. Um, yeah, so I'm a born and raised a Laker fan too. Um, oh, my mother got to meet Chick Hearn, rest in heaven, and his wife, Mar- Margie, uh, as typical as it sounds when I was when I was – one, two, three years old, my mother was working at a dry cleaners. <laughs> <laughs> and lo and behold, Chickern walks in, drops his dry cleaner, and then wow. he actually sent a letter. Like the husband, Chickern and his wife actually sent a letter to my mom saying that 
how beautiful she was and Aww. thank you and whatnot and that she should be going to beauty beauty pageant. Wow. So she sweet. did enter she did enter one when I was in second grade. It's uh-huh. like right before my swim well, right before my swim career started jumping off. Uh Mrs. Korea. So like no uh, moms. Wow. Yeah. She got third. I know. <laughs> hey, she got third because um uh during the swimsuit competition she she was the only one who wore a one piece. <laughs> <laughs> my mom my mom traditional as hell my mom food as hell my mom is strict um morally strict and high value lady um oh. and that's where i think a lot of the my sis, my little sisters uh and that's the one thing i do have to think of with my parents unlike because my mother my father had to grow up with a doctor as a mother Mm-hmm. brothers as doctors and dentists he didn't want that for us he always said you guys do what you guys want to do like be the best at it and do your best in jesus christ at it mm-hmm. so when i said the army officer thing was kind of i had to kind of do it it's kind of for them the army officership i'm gonna be honest with you the only reason why i did 10 years wanted to do only four but <laughs> the reason why i did 10 was because it was for it was for mom and pops yeah mm-hmm. but everything else right now this is all this is what i've been wanting to do since i was 10 years old that morning star swim club team that i uh that i swam for with coach kang the 1984-88 olympic coach that was defunct since year 2000 when we combined with another team i remade it in 2017 wow mm-hmm. to bring it back because i wanted to do that since i was 10. uh clothing line um my mother's a now a fashion apparel um, owner. Mm-hmm. She's a wholesale owner, and uh, that fashion sense where I want to be interested in fashion comes from my mom, I believe, um, definitely. And she is a plug. I didn't realize she was a plug for the longest time. I was going through other people, and then everyone's like, "Do you know who your mom is?" I'm like, "I don't know. My mom. My mom works hard?" <laughs> Question mark. <laughs> like, oh, your mom is. The wholesaler wholesale. I'm like, oh, my mom is a plug. Oh, okay. And so uh, that's how, uh, you know, she, uh, been able to help my mom and work for my mom uh, throughout this, even even to this day. And um, so, yeah, that's what, uh, how all of it led to becoming this. And I felt like after everything was set, I did want to be a part of in the music game. I did want to see what, you know, management and the entertainment side would look like Mm -hmm. and once i felt like everything was ready i did dabble into sports through management first uh, american football cfl xfl especially when xfl is coming or was actually happening now going to rehappen again soon with the rock being an owner but that idea i realized it in the music business if you're if you're a major stars manager, you could get into the big doors any day. Those doors, those doors will open up any day for you. Mm-hmm. That's awesome, man. Let's talk about like, who are you managing right now? Uh, so right now, so I got 15 male players and six female players. Mm-hmm. Um, some of my female players are in Brazil. I have an Asian American young lady, Taiwanese American, played at UC Davis. She's in, New- she's in England right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, their season is resuming again. Post, uh, uh, they shut down for a little bit because of the variant issues in UK. Canada, in Canada, some players in Armenia right now, uh, players in Germany, uh, Latvia. Um, um, the crazy thing about him, he's a former Army guy too. Mm-hmm. He actually served, played college ball, and then went into the G League. So he's a little bit older than all of his peers, but a uh, crazy combination that we have out there. Um, mm-hmm. Out of curiosity, man, like you're doing all these cool things, apparel, sports management, all like what's next? You know, I know you have a brand called On to the Next. How about is your next brand gonna be like what's next? <laughs> <laughs> um what I really so far we've expanded the brand where we do have pro coaches that work for us, you know, pro coaches in Czech Republic. We also have an MBA trainer that works for us. Mm-hmm. Um I do have several interns. Uh, from Pepperdine, University of Oregon, um, 
And I actually signed my two uh, first two soccer players today because I'm a major league soccer agent too. So congratulations! Yeah. Yes, uh, this was real, bro. Yeah, yeah. I I actually had a couple more calls I could have scheduled, but I was like, nah, I gotta get ready for Agent Hustle Network. I got this is this is showtime. Hey, y'all, I said uh, y'all got time tomorrow, 10 a.m. Pacific <laughs> 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. <laughs> Let's reschedule. But um, one's a 17 year old, um, Ugandan, but he's uh lives in Canada. Uh, very talented, very skilled. Um, I know there's a lot of young Asian American uh, parents out there mm -hmm. and getting a dual citizenship passport for uh, an Asian American student athlete is such a key factor yeah. and getting it at such a younger age, you know, under age of five is so much easier when you are 22 in, in your second semester and in your last year of eligibility where you're now scrambling to get a, a dual citizenship and sometimes with certain asian countries uh, for a male you have to serve the, you got to serve in the army mm -hmm. if you're trying to get one you know um so that's something i've been kind of going with uh kind of trying to help my players maneuver because i do have a half african-american and a half thailand um a female player she played in pepperdine university she's very her coaching staff told me she's a point god she, she, they're like eddie take care of our girl that's our point god like that is a killer and she is um but her thing is thailand national team is interested in having her represent but she she needs to get her you know dual citizenship and her father is thai, thai and a thai citizen so now we're going through with that route. Um, same with the Taiwanese American girl. She's, her dream is to play for the Taiwanese national team. Mm -hmm. And for her, if she was a male, definitely a lot harder because she's gonna have to serve in the army for the Taiwan, the Taiwan, uh, Taiwan army. But because she's female, she only needs to stay there for a year, live there for a year because her father is still a Taiwanese passport holder even mm. though her mom's a U.S. citizen. So it's something to, it's something, you know, Asian American parents, uh, it's something I would try to do too, um, if we had the opportunity. And I'm very familiar with this because uh, the 2004 Olympic games was the last one probably South Korea was gonna let, if your father or mother was still a citizen, that even if you're born in another country, you'd be able to compete or at least try out for the team. And I got that opportunity because my mother is a U.S. citizen, but my father is still a Korean passport holder and a green card holder here. Mm -hmm. So um, I was able to try out and still get looked at for the Korean national team. Um, wow. It's just that they wanted me to delay a year of school. And that means another year under mom and dad's roof. And that's not that's not how my plans, you know, I'm trying to <laughs> trying to live my life, you know, uh, get out of mom and dad's shadow. So uh so yeah, that's something like what is what's next for 2021. So uh, I've been uh, while well, watching some college games, you know, uh, I got a lot of D3, D2 cats uh, and some division one players. But I have those stories where they might have not have been a scholarship player, but they're now getting being a professional basketball player, getting the minutes that they didn't get in college. Mm -hmm. uh, this year, however, I'm taking a new approach. I'm trying to expand. I'm trying to get the high level players. Um, Brian, one of my goals, uh, and I, Maggie, I hope you're familiar with this, but I want to find a sensation. I want to find a 17, 18 year old sensation. But all three of us know school is needed, but school is overrated at the same time. <laughs> school is always going to be there. Your athletic career is not. I could be uh, being an ex athlete. I could tell you that <laughs> athletic career is not going to be there for your life. All their time is undefeated, um, except for Tom Brady and LeBron. Everyone, <laughs> except for them, most athletes, ninety nine percent of athletes, father time will get you. Mm -hmm. Injuries will get you, and uh, for example, for a sport like soccer, you could be a sensation at seventeen. You mm -hmm. know, you could be a professional millionaire at seventeen years old. You know, basketball. Screw the NCAA. That's that's the that's a, a dictatorship right there. Screw them. Make your million dollars as an eighteen year old pro. Make a million out overseas. Put that money aside like Lamelo Ball did, and then get drafted. You'll always have my, school. Will always be there for you. 
that, that will never go. So um, that uh, soccer. Um, I'm also studying to be a Canadian Football League agent. Wow. So okay. getting in the realm of uh, football. Really yes. Um, I'm a sportsman at the end of the day. Uh -huh. uh, sports is my thing I love to do. And it's, it's, it's my core. I love music. Being an, okay, being a sports agent, I say being an ex-athlete, when you win a race that you weren't supposed to win, an unexpected relay win, you can't even eat dinner. All you could think about is that adrenaline rush and replaying that moment over and over again. There's only one minute, but you could just only replay it over and over. And you go to bed at three, four, five in the morning and you're like, oh man, I didn't go to sleep today. <laughs> I haven't felt that feeling since I stopped swimming. I, I, since I stopped being an athlete, I haven't felt that. Being a swim coach, I had my first, I had my high school's first undefeated season in over 50 years. Um, and gave me an itch, gave me a part of that feeling, not there. Being an army officer, serving the country, getting paid well because of uh, everyone's tax dollars. It was fun, it was cool, but it didn't give me that same feeling. Mm -hmm. Being in the music business, same, love it, love to be a part of it, love to help, but it didn't, I have passion for it, but the passion that I had as an athlete was different. I, I was dedicated everything. I was, I wanted to say as an athlete, I was a very, very disciplined athlete. And I kind of bring, I want to say life comes full circle for me, uh, all my lessons as a swim coach, all my lessons as an army officer, all my lessons as an ex-athlete, and all my lessons learning, going through higher education in America, learning what corporate America looks like, helped me become this agent that I am. And um, I'm gonna give a shout out to one of my players, my player JT, he'd be like, man, you were born to do this, Mr. Ed, you were born to do this. That's all he tells me. Like, man, you were born to do this. Like, I've talked to different agents before you and I. You, you it, you it. You know, you're the one. And um, he he always loves the fact that I could relate to the younger generation really well. Um, mm -hmm. And I want to level up to the NBA, NFL, Major League Baseball. Like, level up from the FIBA and uh, CFL move up to NBA, NFL, and Major League Soccer and WNBA. The dedication to the That's craft. Awesome. And we are at the top of the hour, man. And we freaking enjoy this podcast and your story, bro. Yeah. You know, man, you, thank you. you. Thank you a lot, dude. And man, I, uh, hey, anytime you guys need me back on, um, I'll have more new updates as time goes on because for me it is, hey, Homeland, Homeland Asia, uh, kids and Asian American kids, we grew up a little differently. We do go with different experiences, and I yeah. feel like my life story could definitely help out. And uh, and I want to say health as well, because for the first time in 15, 16 years, that freshman 40 I gained, I've at least lost 25 of it right now. So I'm <laughs> congratulations. How can our listeners find out more about you and reach yeah. out to you, man? Um, my personal IG at Wow It's Edward, and uh, of course. Uh, Big Game Management love at, it, love it. at Big Game, B-I-G-G-A-M-E, uh, M-G-M-T. Um, you can find us on YouTube. You'll find our YouTube channel. We'll have my shoe unboxing and nice. me collabing with my uh, hoopers that want to shoe unbox or my models that want to shoe unbox with me or comment. And uh, and you'll see highlight tapes on there. So. Oh, dude, man. Awesome. I appreciate that. Appreciate you coming to the show today, man. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Hey guys, we hope you enjoyed this episode. Please subscribe to the show. We would like to get to the top 10 on iTunes, so be sure to leave us a five-star review. We release an episode every single Wednesday, so stay tuned. Thank you guys so much.